Elliptic motion is a more general form of motion than circular motion, and it has a more complicated description in kinematics. We talk about elliptic motion, when a body moves in an elliptical orbit. That is the trajectory of the traveling point mass is an ellipse. It is a planar motion but not necessarily a uniform one. In nature or in everyday life we normally meet such types of elliptical motion, where the speed of the traveling body is changing along its path. However, it is a periodic motion, which means that the body takes the same time t to complete each revolution around the ellipse, where t is the period of the motion. Let us consider some examples for elliptical motion. The most famous example for such a type of motion is the planetary motion. The orbits of the planets of our solar system around the sun are elliptical, and the sun sits at one of the foci of the elliptic planetary orbits. In fact, many objects or projectiles moving in the gravitational fields of a massive object exhibit such type of motion, provided some conditions hold, as we will see in the course on dynamics. Another famous example is the Bohr-Sommerfeld atomic model, where the orbits of electrons for different states of the electron shell may be both circular and elliptic. These different states or electron orbits are represented with a set of numbers, called quantum numbers. This model was successful in paving the way into the modern study of the structure of atoms, namely quantum mechanics, which replaced the former theories of atomic physics. We can also find examples for elliptic motion in industrial technologies. This type of motion is proven to be useful in the screening process of particle flow. Elliptical motion vibrating screens combine the advantages of linear and circular motion screens. Elliptical motion screening machines are driven by two centric main shafts, which generate a swing diameter as in a free-running drive. Another synchronized shaft transforms the swing diameter into an ellipse. The big advantage of this method is that machines can work with a very low inclination or with no inclination at all, enabling space-saving horizontal installation and high material throughput. Another industrial application of elliptic motion is the elliptic vibration cutting method, where the workpiece is fed against the vibrating tool along the nominal cutting direction. Some piezoelectric transducers are arranged in a metal block to drive the tool tip to vibrate elliptically. The advantage of this method is that the pulling action applied by the cutting tool can assist to pull chips away from the workpiece and lead to a reverse friction during each cutting cycle, which increases the precision of the process. Like circular motion, elliptical motion is also an accelerating motion. In the general case, both the length and the direction of the velocity of the moving body are changing instantaneously. In any two points P and P' prime of the path of the motion, the velocity vectors V and V' prime point in different directions, and they have different magnitudes. As a result, the acceleration of the body is non-zero throughout the whole elliptical orbit. Let us start the discussion on the kinematics of a body moving on an ellipse with the trajectory equation of the body, called polar equation, since it can be derived from the geometric properties of the plane curve of the trajectory. An ellipse is a closed plane curve with from two fixed points F1 and F2, separated by a distance of 2 times c. Here we can see an ellipse with its center in the origin of the Cartesian coordinate system. The length of its semi-major axis is denoted by A, and the length of its semi-minor axis is equal to B. The eccentricity E of the ellipse is defined by the square root of 1 minus the ratio of B squared to A squared, and describes the deviation of the shape of an ellipse from the one of a circle. If the eccentricity vanishes, then the length of the semi-major axis is equal to the one of the semi-minor axis. That is the plane curve as a circle, which shows that the circles belong to a special class of ellipses. The eccentricity can be expressed as the ratio of the distance c of the fixed points from the center to the length a of the semi-major axis. If the point p denotes the instantaneous position of a body moving on the ellipse, then we can measure the distance of the point p from the fixed points or foci of the ellipse. By definition, the sum of the distances, f1p and f2p is equal to 2 times the length a of the semi-major axis of the ellipse. Now we can choose any of the foci as the reference point of the motion. If the choose the fixed point F1, the position vector are pointing to the point P from the point F1 describes the instantaneous position P of the moving body. Here theta is the central angle measured between the major axis and the vector R. The length of the position vector is denoted by R, which is equal to the distance F1P. Then the distance F2P is simply 2 times A minus R. Now we can apply the cosine theorem for the angle theta and the triangle P F1, F2, which tells us that the square of 2 times A minus R is equal to R squared, plus the square of 2 times C, minus 4C times R times cosine theta. By calculating the square of the left-hand side of the equation, we obtain 4 times A squared, minus 4 times A times R, plus R squared. 
this is equal to r squared, plus 4 times c squared, minus 4 times c times r times cosine theta. The terms r squared cancel out each other on the both sides of the equation, and we can divide the result by 4. Then we obtain that a squared minus a times r is equal to c squared minus c times r times cosine theta. If we regroup the terms in this equation, we see that a squared minus c squared is equal to r times a minus c times cosine theta. Since c can be written as the product of a times e, we also see that a squared times 1 minus e squared is equal to a times r times 1 minus e times cosine theta. We solve this equation for r, which gives the distance r of the point p from the focal point f1 as a function of the angle theta. This function is called the polar equation, and states that the distance r is equal to a times 1 minus the square of e, divided by 1 minus e times cosine theta. If we measure the distance of the point P from the focal point F2, the angle theta prime we use in the cosine theorem is measured at the corner F1, F2, P and it is equal to 180 degrees minus theta, or pi minus theta measured in radians. Then we can write that the square of 2A minus R is equal to R squared, plus the square of 2 times C, minus 4C times R times the cosine of pi minus theta. Since the cosine of pi minus theta is equal to minus cosine theta, we can substitute it in the last term in the right-hand side. This only changes the sign of the last term, therefore the polar equation can be written the following form. The distance r is equal to a times 1 minus e squared divided by 1 plus e times cosine theta. Then the general form of the polar equation states that, the distance r of the position p of the moving body from any of the foci is a function of the angle theta, and it is given by a times 1 minus e squared divided 1 minus plus e times cosine theta. If the distance of the moving body is measured from the fixed point F1, then we use the minus sign in the equation. If it is measured from the fixed point F2, we use the plus sign. As already mentioned, the examples of elliptic motion taken from our everyday experience and nature show, that a body traveling along an elliptic path generally does not have uniform motion. Neither its speed nor its angular velocity is constant along its orbit. However, there is one special criterion, which holds in many cases of elliptical motion the conservation of the aerial velocity of the body. In order to understand the concept of aerial velocity of moving bodies, let us determine it in a mathematical form. Aerial velocity of a point mass is defined by the area swept out by the position vector of the point mass per unit time. We will illustrate what this quantity means in the case of elliptical motion. Here we see an ellipse with the foci F1 and F2. Let us choose the fixed point F1 as the reference point of motion. If the instantaneous position of the body is at the point P at the time T, then the position vector RT of the body points to the location P from the fixed point F1. At the time T plus delta T, the moving point mass reaches the point P prime. Its position vector is RT plus delta T. During the time interval delta T, the position vector of the body sweeps out the area within the ellipse enclosed by the vectors RT and RT plus delta T. Let us compute this area. The two vectors define the parallelogram F2, P, Q, P prime, and we can compute its vector area by taking the vector product of the two vectors. That is, the vector area A of the parallelogram is equal to the cross product of RT times RT plus delta T. The direction of the vector area is simply perpendicular to the plane of the ellipse in which the two vectors lie. Then the vector area of triangle F2, P, P prime is the half of the one of the parallelogram. If delta T tends to zero, then the vector area of the triangle will approach the area swept out the position vector during the time interval delta t. We can use this approximation with the triangular area to define the aerial velocity of the point mass traveling on the ellipse, if we take the ratio of vector area of the triangle to the duration delta t, and compute the its limit as delta t tends to zero. Now we can approximate the cross product as follows. Our t plus delta t can be written as our t plus the time derivative of our t times delta t in the first order, which can be substituted into the cross product. If we factor out the terms in the square bracket, then the cross product of the position vector RT with itself vanishes. Then we obtain the cross product of RT and RT dot times delta T, and we can insert this result into the definition of the aerial velocity. We see that the derivative of the area vector A with respect to the time is equal to the half of the vector product of R and R dot. Since R dot is simple the velocity of the body, the aerial velocity of the point mass is given by the half of the cross product of its position vector and its velocity. If the plane of the elliptical trajectory of the motion is seen with a given inclination angle, we can show the result of this cross product in three dimensions. 
Here we see the instantaneous location P of the body which is described by the moving position vector R. The velocity V is the tangent to the elliptical trajectory at the point P. Both the position vector and the velocity of the body lie in the plane of the ellipse. Since the cross product of these vectors gives the aerial velocity, the later one is perpendicular to the plane of the ellipse, that is points in the direction of the z-axis. It is useful to derive the aerial velocity expressed in cylindrical coordinates, where the coordinate system is attached to the fixed point, chosen as the reference point of the motion. We already derived the position vector written in the cylindrical coordinates rho, phi and z. It is equal to rho times the basis vector e rho. Since we talk about planar motion, its z component vanishes. The velocity, which is tangential to the ellipse in point P, is given by rho dot times the basis vector e rho, plus rho times phi dot times the basis vector e phi. Then the vector product of the position vector and the velocity is equal to rho times e rho multiplied by rho dot times e rho, plus rho times phi dot times e phi. We can factor out the terms in the parenthesis, and the cross product of e rho with itself vanishes. Since the cross product of e rho and e phi gives e z, we obtain rho squared times phi dot times e z. Since the aerial velocity of the body has only a z component, it is perpendicular to the plane of the motion, as expected. Let us replace the coordinate rho with r, and the azimuthal angle phi with theta, which are the more popular notations of these coordinates in this context. Of course the radial coordinate r is the distance of the body from the reference point, here the fixed point f1. Theta is the central angle measured at the reference point between the position vector r of the body and a chosen reference direction, here the x-axis. Then we can write the magnitude of the aerial velocity of a moving body, as the half of the square of its distance r from the reference point of the motion, times the derivative of the central angle theta with respect to the time t. In the case of planetary motion, or more generally, in the case of bodies orbiting in the gravitational field of another object, the aerial velocity of the orbiting body is conserved. Motivated by these examples, we will derive the equations of motion for elliptical motion with constant aerial velocity. If we attach a polar coordinate system with the origin O to any of the foci of the elliptic trajectory, then the position of the orbiting point mass is given by the position vector with the radial coordinate r, and the azimuthal angle phi. When we determine the equations of motions for circular motion, we use the general form of the kinematic quantities expressed in polar coordinates. In the general case of the elliptic motion, the position of a moving body is given by the radial coordinate r and the azimuthal angle phi, which are some given functions of the time t. The relationship between these two coordinates is described with the polar equation. The velocity of the body is the tangent to its orbit at the point p. Its radial component is equal to the derivative of the radial coordinate r with respect to the time. Its azimuthal component is given by the radial coordinate r times the derivative of the azimuthal angle phi with respect to the time. Since the motion of the body is not uniform, its acceleration is not perpendicular to the velocity. The radial component of the acceleration is equal to our double dot, minus r times the square of phi dot, and its azimuthal component is given by r times phi double dot, plus 2 times r dot times phi dot. Now we assume that the aerial velocity of the traveling body is constant, that is the magnitude of the time derivative of the area A swept out by the body is constant along the motion. As a result, the half of the square of the radial coordinate r, times the derivative of the azimuthal angle phi is constant. By virtue of this equation, we can state that r squared times phi dot is equal a given constancy. Since the aerial velocity is constant, the aerial acceleration vanishes and the derivative of this equation is equal to zero. This gives the expression stating that, 2 times r times r dot times phi dot, plus r squared times phi double dot vanishes. Since the radial coordinate r is not equal to zero, we can divide this equation by r. Then, 2 times r dot times phi dot, plus r times phi double dot is equal to zero. But we recognize that this expression is equal to the azimuthal component of the acceleration, that is a phi is zero. Therefore, the acceleration of the traveling body points in the opposite direction of its position vector, if its aerial velocity is constant along the orbit. Now we can present the equations of motion for elliptic orbits with constant aerial velocity. The position of the body is still given by the radial coordinate r and the azimuthal angle phi as functions of time. As already stated, the radial coordinate can be expressed in the term of the polar angle by the polar equation. This expression is the trajectory equation of the orbiting body. The radial component of the velocity of the body is given by the derivative of the radial coordinate r with respect to the time. 
its azimuthal coordinate is equal to the radial coordinate r times the derivative of the azimuthal angle phi with respect to the time. By substituting the magnitude of the aerial velocity in this expression, we can write the azimuthal component as 2 times the length of the aerial velocity divided by the radial coordinate r. This equation is still a general expression for elliptical orbits. If we take the conservation of the aerial velocity into account, we can see that v phi is equal to the constant c divided by the radial coordinate r. This means that the azimuthal component of the velocity of the orbiting body is inversely proportional to its distance from the foci, where c is the proportionality constant. The radial component of the acceleration of the body is equal to r double dot, minus r times the square of phi dot, whereas its azimuthal component vanishes. The second term of the radial component can be expressed in the term of the aerial velocity, as 4 times the square of a dot divided by the cube of r. This is a general expression for elliptic motion. For the constant aerial velocity, we can write the radial component of the acceleration as the derivative of the radial velocity with respect to the time, minus the square of the constant c divided by the cube of the radial coordinate. As we have demonstrated, the azimuthal component of the acceleration vanishes in the case of constant aerial velocity. Since the acceleration has only a radial component, we talk about central motion, that is the acceleration always points towards a central point, which is one of the foci of the ellipse. However, the vanishing azimuthal component of the acceleration does not mean that the traveling body has no acceleration along its orbit. The tangential acceleration of the body is the projection of the radial acceleration onto the tangential direction, which is given by the scalar product of the acceleration and the normalized velocity. The latter one is the unit tangent to the elliptical orbit. This projection does not vanish, even if the aerial velocity of the body is constant. 